Today, we're gonna to install a raised bed drip irrigation system. We're gonna use one of Drip Depot's raised bed irrigation kits, but to determine which one, we're first gonna design and plan the system. All of our kits are fully customizable and with just a few small changes can accommodate any layout. Here's the hose bibble we use in to supply water to the raised beds. If your house has one of these, you can have an automatic drip irrigation system. The hose bib is where we set up our head assembly. A head assembly just consists of a backflow preventer, a filter, a pressure regulator, and the adapter that connects your mainline tubing to the rest. Before we do that, we'll test the flow rate to see how many raised beds we can feed at once. But most residential flow rates will be more than enough to feed five beds. Once we have our mainline tubing connected here to our hose bib, we're gonna run it over this way here so it's not crisscrossing through the yard. We'll cross the path right here, and then we're gonna secure it to this baseboard. This fence measures 35 feet going this way. You see, this is a pretty typical design for a garden, and I'll show you how easily you can get a drip irrigation system installed here. All five beds from just one, one half inch mainline. So here's the garden we're working with today. It's got five raised beds. Three of them are 12 by four. Two of them are eight by four. Here's one of our 12 by four beds. In addition to getting water to the beds, we're gonna irrigate some of these containers that have plants growing in them here. The raised bed kits come with some button trippers and you can just run off your main line. I'll show you how to do that here in a little bit. Here's one of our eight by four beds. You can see it's got quite a few plants in it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run three lengths of drip line down each bed. Each bed, being four feet wide, will receive three lengths of one quarter inch drip line. Quarter inch drip line has emitters inside, pre-installed, so you don't have to put them in yourself. And each emitter puts out about half a gallon per hour. Here's one of our eight by four beds and another container that we're gonna irrigate here at the base of it. It's one of our 12 by four beds with some squash. And finally, right behind us here, we've got our last bed, another 12 by four bed that has some melons and squashes growing in it as well. So when planning a drip irrigation system, the design stage is very crucial. Some of the most important parts of the design and planning stage are to take measurements of the area, measurements of the bed, and make a sketch out of it. The sketch is very important. It'll help you know how many fittings you need to use, mainline tubing you're gonna need, how many emitters, how many runs of drip line. Do the sketch and design before you even order anything. You don't want to over order or under order. Doing the planning stage well will save you time, money, and help you achieve the vision you have for your garden. One of the most important steps in the planning stage is to test the flow rate of your water source. This will tell you how many emitters you can feed in your garden. For example, if you have 200 gallons per hour of emitters installed in your beds, but only 150 gallons per hour of your water source, some of the emitters will be starved of water and not operate as they should if they even operate at all. We fill our bucket and we time how long it takes to fill it. We open our hose bib valve all the way so we get an accurate reading. After that, you can either do the math yourself or you just go to our website at dripdepot.com and enter the variables into our flow rate calculator. Then you'll have your gallons per hour. Container size was two gallons. Time to fill was 45. 0.6 seconds. This gives us a result of 157.89 gallons per hour. Our helpful flow rate calculator can be found in the description below. If you'd like to do the math yourself, it's not actually too difficult. Divide the volume of the container by the time it took to fill it. In our case, that was two gallons over 45.6 seconds. Multiply that result by 60 and you have your gallons per minute, which is also a handy number to know. Multiply it by another 60 and you have your gallons per hour. Now that we see the scope of our project and know the flow rate of our water source, so let's make our sketch and see what we're going to need for this project. When making your sketch, it's best to do it on graphing paper if you can, and draw it to a specific scale. For the sketch that we're doing here, I did each square equals one foot. This makes it really easy to add up how many feet of main line you'll need, how much drip line you'll need. So we got our beds drawn in. As you can see, using one square equals one foot. We have the 12 by four ones, 12 squares down, four squares across. Eight by fours, eight squares down, and four squares across. Makes it really easy to plan the drip irrigation system. Now we're gonna draw our mainline tubing path. I'm gonna use a blue pen for my mainline tubing. That way I can differentiate it from the other marks, such as the black ink I use to draw in the beds. So we know our main line's gonna come in from down here. I'm gonna secure it to the base of the fence. We know our mainline tubing is going to come into the garden. We're going to use a cross fitting here to get tubing to both of the beds. Now, you can mark what fittings you're going to use on the sketch. So what you want to keep in mind is use cross when the tubing needs to go in four different directions at once, a T when it needs to go in three different directions at once. We use an elbow fitting for all 90 degree turns. So for example, on the beds, I know each bed is going to take at least a minimum of two elbows. One elbow to get the tubing traveling up the bed and one to get it travel over the top where we're gonna build our header. Mm -hmm. 
Now that I've got my mainline tubing drawn, all I have to do is count up how many squares it goes through, and that will tell me how much mainline tubing I need. It's generally a good idea to get a little bit of extra just to make sure you have enough to take care of any unplanned for variables and to make repairs in the future. Looking at the sketch and knowing I have each square marked as one foot, doing a quick count, I see that I'll need about 90 feet of one half inch mainline tubing. Now let's go ahead and draw in our drip lines. For the drip lines, I'm gonna use an orange pen here. So we know the plan with our four foot wide beds is to do three runs of drip line in each one. We know each run of drip line will be capped off by a goof plug. So you could even notate that on there, uh, like a little circle at the end for an end cap or a goof plug. There we go. Now that we've got our drip lines drawn in, we can count how many squares they take up and that'll tell us how much drip line we're gonna need to install for the raised beds. It's pretty easy to do the math in your head too. You know your beds are 12 feet, so three runs of drip line, each one 12 feet long, 36 feet per 12 foot bed, 24 feet per eight foot bed. So a little trick that will serve you very well and be very helpful is just to write down at the very bottom of the sketch, how many and what type of fittings you have. You can use your sketch to help you determine that. For example, Every place there's a 90 degree turn, at least one elbow. I know there's two elbows for bed, so I will say two, four, six, eight, ten elbows minimum, plus an 11th for I turn in here, a 12th down here. So you can just write in elbow or L or 90 degree, and then how many? Same thing with the cross fittings. Any place where the tubing goes in four directions at once, and there's one on our sketch, you're gonna need at least one cross. T's. Locations where the tubing goes three directions at once. I see at least one and two on our sketch. That doesn't mean that's how many I'll get. If I count two T's on my sketch, I might pick up three just in case. Any locations our half inch main line comes to an end, we know that we'll need an end cap. So that's going to be one, two, three, four, five end caps. We know every location that our drip line ends, we're gonna need to cap for it too. Those are called goof plugs. You'll count those up and make sure to mark it on your sketch. Goof plugs are also used to fill holes made in the half inch main line by a quarter inch punch, so you'll definitely want some extra. That's one of the reasons they call them a goof plug. Trust me on the goof plugs. The sketch calls for a minimum of 15 goof plugs. Knowing that I might make mistakes and knowing they come in packs of 10, I would probably get 30 for this one. Now that we have our layout planned, let's count out the emitters we're using to make sure our water source can support the system. We have five total beds. Three of them are 12 by four, and we use three runs of drip line in them. Two of them are eight by four, and we're also going to use three lines in those. This means that our large 12 by four beds each have 36 feet of drip line in them. Our two smaller eight by four beds have a total of 24 feet of drip line in them. This gives us a total of 108 feet of drip line for the three 12 by four beds and 48 feet of drip line for the two eight by four beds, which is a grand total of 156 feet of drip line. Our drip line has a half gallon per hour emitter spaced every 12 inches inside. This gives us a total of 156 emitters operating at 78 gallons per hour. And the smaller containers, we're using between 67 emitters each. This means that our entire system flow has a flow rate of 88 gallons per hour, well below the 157 gallons per hour we measured at the water source. Fantastic. That means we not only have enough flow, but we have a bit of a cushion for those unaccounted for variables or in case we want to expand our system someday, might put in a few more beds. Now that we've got our materials list, we know what and how many to order. Now that I have the sketch completed, I notice that it matches up pretty well with the deluxe irrigation kit for raised bed. It's not a perfect match, but I think the kit will work great as a template and only needs a few small customizations. I'm going to remove some of the button drippers since we only have a few onion containers that need them. The kit comes with enough coupling valves for six beds and we have five, so I'm gonna remove one of those. And I added some one half inch and one quarter inch J stakes to help keep the main line and drip line in place as we laid it out. Since the water up here is pretty hard, I decided to swap out the inline filter for the larger canister filter. The larger surface area should give me more time between cleanings. There are some other minor changes I'm gonna make to the kit. For example, leaving out the one quarter inch C-clamps. I don't think we're gonna need them to secure any of our drip line or quarter inch tubing to the beds. Our box of parts arrived and believe it or not, a full five bed drip irrigation system fits in this little box. Let's open it up and take a look inside. Here's our timer so we can automate the system. The timer I went with is the Hydrologic 
one zone digital timer. This entirely automates the irrigation system. It'll come on when we tell it to, it'll operate as long as we tell it to, and it's got a nice, easy to read digital readout. This here is the drip line that we're gonna be running three rows down each garden bed. You can see that the drip line has a hole in it. Now that's not just a hole in a tubing that water comes out, that's not how drip irrigation works. Beneath that is actually an emitter, and the emitter itself has like a labyrinthine passage that helps control the output of water to keep each hole dripping at about half a gallon per hour. Here's our quarter inch tubing. Now this kind here doesn't have any holes in it. This here is just for transporting water. We'll be using this to run off of our main line to get into the container. So what you do is you cut off how much you need and then you can put a dripper in the open end of this. Here's the filter. This is part of our head assembly along with the timer. A head assembly is usually a timer, backflow preventer, filter, and a pressure regulator, and then the tubing adapter to get your mainline tubing connected. Here's a bag of fittings and drippers. This here is something that we'll organize into like fittings. We'll cover that in a little bit. All right, here's our half inch mainline tubing. This here, at only half an inch, believe it or not, is our main line. Half inch tubing is generally good for up to about 200 feet in length and 200 gallons per hour, and we'll be well underneath both of those here. Half inch tubing is very economical, especially compared to larger sizes of tubing since it uses less material. So a quick tip here is to cut the bands that hold the tubing together and place it in direct sunlight. The thermal expansion helps the tubing relax and makes it much easier to install. Now we'll just leave it in the sun for a little bit and it'll start uncoiling all by itself and relax it. Not only does it make it easier to lay down in a line that you want to put down, but it also makes it easier to push on over the barb on the permalock fitting. Here's some of the fittings that didn't go into the bag. We got our end caps here. We got a big bag of elbows here. Remember, we need a minimum two elbows per bed and then an elbow for every other 90 degree turn we're gonna be taking here. So I got quite a few elbows. Another bag of elbows. All right, so there's two kind of stakes in here. I've got the stabilizer stakes here. These I'm going to be using with the button drippers. What a stabilizer stake does, you put your tubing right in there, and that's to keep the dripper up out of the soil. And here's our wire stakes, or J stakes, some people like to call them, to hold down our mainline tubing. When your tubing starts, as you unroll it and run it where it needs to go, it's good to stake it in place to keep it from moving around. And when you turn on the system, the violence of the pressurization will cause the tubing to move, so better if it's held down so it doesn't get displaced. Got a bag of coupling valves. These are very handy and I'll cover their use while we're installing the bed. They're optional, but you'll see how handy they are. So we're gonna take our parts over to a staging area. I have some handy tips and tricks to share too. It's helpful to organize like items and keep them in a safe place. We've got all of our parts organized into piles. You can see I've got tees with tees, the lone cross fitting, elbows with elbows. Some of them I'll go ahead and leave in their packaging, particularly the one quarter inch parts. The reason why, you can see they're very small. That's a one quarter inch elbow there. So opening the package of these, tends to get them lost. One thing that's handy, and you might want to leave some things in the package for, the labels or the print on there will tell you what's inside the bag. So if you're not sure what part that is, you can just look right here. Like this one here says, Permalock one half inch poly tubing elbow, a pack of five. So I know exactly what this part is. Now that we've got our parts all sorted and organized, let's go install our head assembly. It's very important you install the head assembly that you do it in the correct order. First up is our timer. It's very important that the timer goes first because it's the only part that's rated for constant pressure. The internal valve is sturdy enough to handle the static pressure of the water always pushing against it. The other parts cannot. We see a lot, people like to put their backflow preventer on first, but if the backflow preventer is put on before the timer, the internal mechanisms will quickly wear out under the constant pressure. All right, let's get our timer installed on the hose bib. One handy thing with hose threaded parts, you always wanna check for the gasket or O-ring on the female side. Hose threaded parts should never use silicone tape. Silicone tape can actually cause damage to plastic hose threaded parts. It's the gasket inside that creates the watertight seal. All right, putting on our timer. Using the swivel here, a swivel's handy. You can turn just the swivel instead of the entire timer. Now our backflow preventer goes on. I'm gonna thread it on until it engages the gasket. With head assemblies and hose threaded components, you really just wanna finger tighten and maybe another quarter to half inch turn after that. You don't even need a hand tighten and definitely don't use tools. Next up is our filter. It will filter out any debris that could get into the pressure regulator. The filter is very important. Even on a municipal system, it will sometimes have particulates that are difficult to see by the human eye. We have a very, very fine mesh screen here that can get the smallest of debris. Finger tighten, one quarter turn. Next up is our pressure regulator. This is a 25 PSI pressure regulator that will maintain downstream pressure. And last up is our hose by tubing adapter. This is the part that connects our mainline tubing to the rest of the head assembly and thus the water source. If you can't find your hose by tubing adapter, it could be because you have it mixed in with your end caps. These two parts look remarkably similar, 
but one of them is a hose by tubing adapter and one of them is an end cap. You can see here at the bottom, there's two types of hose by tubing adapters. We have the straight adapter and this 90 degree elbow adapter. This one works if you want to bring your tubing straight down to the ground. It also works well for tight spaces. We're going to use this one today. And again, finger tighten and then a quarter turn. All right, that's the complete head assembly. See how easy that was? Now let's install our mainline tubing. Tighten down the locking nut. I'm gonna cut the tubing here so we can elbow it over. Gonna get a stake to stake it in place. Then I'll continue to run my tubing towards the garden, staking it along the way. Here at this sharp 90 degree turn, I'm gonna use an elbow fitting. So I'm just putting an elbow fitting here at the very bottom of the fence here so we can go ahead and turn the tubing run in and go straight into the garden. When we start connecting our beds, we're already there. All the way on over the barb and then twist the locking nut into position. And we're in the garden. Now we're gonna use our cross fitting here so we can split the tubing to both beds. So if I get it just right, I'll be able to go straight to this bed and direct to that bed. Keeps it neat and orderly looking. This tubing will take gentle angles, but it looks better if it's in straight lines. One nice thing about permalock fittings is they're completely reusable. Uh, you'll see barbed insert and compression fittings. Uh, barbed insert can be reusable, but compression fittings typically aren't. Uh, these are built to be reused. So our design initially called for a cross fitting. Uh, what we didn't anticipate is that the onion containers had rooted into the ground below. This is a great example of how the reusability of permalock fittings can come in handy. And also, since I took my own advice and ordered more fittings than my plans called for, I don't have to put my project on hold. I'm gonna install this T fitting here so that we can split our tubing to get to the beds on either side of this garden here. And secure the locking nut. So we're gonna go ahead and do this bed in its entirety. This bed will be done the same way all the other beds will do. So let's get this one set up and get our drip line ran. If you get any dirt into your tubing, this is one of the reasons we'll flush the system before we start operating the drip line. So once I run the tubing over to this bed, I'll use an elbow at the very bottom of the bed to get our tubing going vertically up the wall of the bed. Once at the top, we'll use another elbow to get it traveling across the top of the bed, where we'll put an end cap at the end of it. So we secure the tubing to the bed with a tubing clamp with nail. It makes it much easier to hold the tubing in place, which makes it easier to work with and install other fittings. All right, we got our elbow in place at the top of the bed so we can take the tubing all the way down to the end where we'll cap it off. So now that we've got the tubing connected to the elbow here, I went ahead and cut the tubing there because we want to install a coupling valve. What this valve does is give each bed its own on and off. So for example, if you harvest your sweet potatoes before your pumpkin, you can turn off the sweet potato bed just by doing that. With the tubing at the top and our coupling valve installed, I'm going to go ahead and clamp the tubing down to the top of the bed here. Make sure you put the tubing clamp in a spot you're not going to want to punch in to run your drip line. Because remember, you have to punch a hole in your main line to start your drip line runs. All right, let's go ahead and cap off the end of our run here. Remember I mentioned flushing. That's what's handy about the permalock end caps is they're threaded. So you can simply remove the cap, let water come out when you're flushing and then put the cap back on. There we go, our header row is complete. Now, let's install our drip line. So let's go ahead and punch the first hole. I'm gonna use our one quarter inch pro punch here. This punch is good here. It gives you lots of leverage. Punching tubing, it's easiest when the tubing is cold, so like early in the morning or later in the evening. Oops, if you make a mistake punching a hole in the wrong spot, all's not lost. All you need is this one quarter inch goof plug. This will fill any holes made by the one quarter inch punch. Interestingly, this same part is what we'll use to cap off the end of our one quarter inch drip line runs. Using a pair of needle nose pliers can make it a lot easier to insert into the tubing. There we go, problem taken care of. 
So I'm going to punch the hole here. It's nice and in line with this row of plants right here. And we can just run our drip line with 12 inch spacing straight down the row. Water tends to spread out about 12 inches from the point of drip. This will all happen beneath the soil. If everything's going right, the wet spot on top of the soil should remain small. This helps prevent evaporation, runoff. It's basically one of the things that drives drip irrigation's efficiency. So once we got our hole punched, we're going to use this one quarter inch coupling. We're going to insert one end of it into that hole. The other end will connect to our one quarter inch drip line. Seat the coupling all the way down to that right there. Here's our quarter inch drip line. It has an emitter about every 12 inches, one on each of my thumbs right now. So the first 12 inches here doesn't have an emitter, as you can see. So that's the end I'm gonna connect to our quarter inch coupling. That way I don't have any water dripping on the frame of the bed or a place that there's not a plant. I'm just gonna put emitters near as I can to the plants. One handy thing about one quarter inch drip line is it's flexible enough to bend and snake through an area. So if your plants aren't in a perfect row, that's okay. You can kind of S shape it through your bed. Once I reach the end of the bed, I'll just cut it with some scissors. So I'm gonna use these little one quarter inch stakes to stake down the quarter inch drip line in the bed. We also have the stabilizer stake that you can use to hold it up out of the soil. It does slightly decrease the risk of clogging to do so, but the drip line is designed to resist clogging either way. So this I would pin down in the soil so I can get it strategically placed in your plants. Remember I used the goof plug to fix the hole that we'd punch in the main line down there. Well, now I'm also gonna use it to close off our one quarter inch drip line run. And there we go. We've got a complete run of one quarter inch drip line. We'll go ahead and go back down to the other end and we're gonna do that two more times. Uh, it's a four foot wide bed. So knowing that emitters spread about 12 inches in the point of drip beneath the soil, I'm gonna run two more lines. Now that we've got our drip line ran, let's do some button drippers in the containers at the bottom of the bed. Installing button drippers is a lot like installing drip line. You punch a one quarter inch hole with your one quarter inch punch, use a one quarter inch coupling, except instead of putting drip line in the other side of the coupling, you're gonna put blank one quarter inch tubing. And that's just carrier tubing. It just moves water from the main line to the button dripper that'll be at the end of it. So I'm gonna cut off a little bit more than I need. I'll show you why. You want the tubing to be on all the way over that barb so that it's touching that lip on the other side. All right, so we'll cut our tubing here. Notice I didn't quite leave myself enough tubing. It's because I want to use a T to split the tubing run. The reason I did this is that I can use this T now I've split it so I can have that go to a button dripper and that one go to a button dripper. And you can further T too. I could have this come off and T again, which is what we're going to do. We're trying to create a little web or network of button drippers in here. Now that we've got our tubing cut, we're gonna go ahead and push our button dripper inside our quarter inch tubing. We'll use the barbed end here to go inside the tubing. I'm gonna use this stabilizer stake here to keep the dripper up out of the soil. Keeps it looking neat and tidy and helps reduce the chance of clogging. Using the T, the button dripper, and the stabilizer stake, we're gonna rinse and repeat to create a little network of button drippers. All right, so now we've got our first bed and our first two containers done. Just a quick recap of what we did. We built our head assembly over at the hose bed and we ran our mainline tubing over here to our first bed where we used a couple elbows to get up the bed, over the bed where we capped it off. We then punched holes in our main line. We can call it our header, inserted our one quarter inch couplings and ran our one quarter inch drip line runs down to the end where we capped them off with a goof plug. After that, we punched holes in the main line on the other side of the header put in our quarter inch coupling and ran some one quarter inch blank tubing so we could create a little network of button drippers for the onion container. Now I'm going to show you how to run our main line to the rest of the beds where we're going to do the same thing. Each bed is four foot wide so they will also get three runs of one quarter inch drip line. Once the second bed's done here, we've got our main line continuing out of the T over here to our third bed. So from that T, we run over to our elbows and up to our coupling valve here. Now remember again, this is the reason why we're teeing off here is so that we turn off that coupling valve. It doesn't turn off our fourth and fifth bed. It just turns off this bed. And we're gonna set up the last two beds similarly, except the last bed won't need that T because it will be the last bed. And so shutting it off only shuts off that bed no matter how you arrange it. All right, let's continue. 
Now we're going to irrigate the container over here. Uh, we'll be doing this a little bit different than we did the other one. The other ones you recall we did with some button drippers. This one here we're going to do with some one quarter inch drip line. We don't want our drip line to start right where our one quarter inch coupling is, or else it'll just simply be dripping either onto the wood or into the dirt below the bed. We want all the water to go right into the soil. So what we're going to use to do that is one quarter inch poly tubing. A lot of folks call this blank poly tubing because as you can see, there's no emitters in it whatsoever. So it just moves water. And then we'll use a one quarter inch coupling at the end of it to connect our one quarter inch drip line to this. That way there's no wasted water and the container gets effectively irrigated. We'll cut the quarter inch tubing about right there and we'll start our quarter inch drip line run. So instead of using a quarter inch coupling here, I decided to use a one quarter inch elbow. One quarter inch poly tubing and one quarter inch drip line are generally flexible enough. You won't have a lot of use for these elbows, but we do in this case, I want to put it here so I can just turn that quarter inch drip line straight in. The reason I want to do that is I don't want to potentially kink this line or the quarter inch drip line. Kinks, they can compromise the structural integrity of the tubing or drip line. They can obstruct the flow of water as well. Now that I've got my elbow installed, I'm gonna go ahead and put a goof plug into the end so it can be pressurized, and then I'm gonna snake it through the container. I've got about five total emitters in this run here, which would be more than enough for this container. Now we've got it staked in. That's how you use one quarter inch drip line to irrigate a container. All right, so now we're gonna put the main line back onto this T here so we can get over to the fourth and fifth bed. At the fourth bed, we'll be doing something slightly different. Instead of using an elbow at the bottom and then an elbow at the top to go up, we're actually going to use a T at the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the T here at the bottom to get the tubing up. This part of the T will carry on our mainline tubing run. This part of the T will send the tubing up the bed where we'll put an elbow at the top. All right, let's go ahead and get the elbow put in for our last bed here, number five. All right, and that's our mainline tubing, now covered to all five beds. All we have left to do is a couple runs of drip line in each bed, and this will be a done project. I'm gonna do something slightly different in this bed in regards to staking than I did the other beds. You'll recall in the other beds, I used one quarter inch J stakes to pin the drip line down into the soil. Sometimes you'll have a situation where you don't want the drip line in the soil. You want to elevate it up a little bit. For that, I'm going to use these one quarter inch stabilizer stakes to hold the drip line in this bed up slightly out of the soil. If you want to be able to get landscape maintenance tools underneath the drip line for some reason and you want to elevate it up, you can use these stabilizer stakes for that. All right, now we've got our drip line in our beds. It's time to flush the system. Flushing is an important step, not one that you should skip. It'll take any debris that got in your system while you were installing, and there will be some, and flush it out the end so it doesn't potentially clog your emitters. All we have to do to flush the system is unthread the end caps. That's last end cap to remove. Let's go turn the water on, and then turn the water on and let water come out at the end. Keep it on until water is coming out of your end caps. You can then shut the water off, recap your end caps, and then you'll be ready to run the first test on your system. All right, now that we've flushed the system, let's go replace our end caps so we can give it its first watering cycle and make sure everything's working, leak-free. If we have to troubleshoot anything, now is the best time to do it. When you do the first watering cycle, give the entire system a walk. Check your fittings, your joints, your connections, your emitters. Make sure your emitters are dripping and nothing else is. Now is the best time to troubleshoot any problems that might come up. While you're fresh with the install, it's pretty easy to fix anything. Oh, yep, got a little leak at the end cap here. Uh, this is fairly common. All you probably need to do is just come give it a little turn, make sure the gasket inside gets seated against the threads. All right, that's another completed project. Five raised beds. We ran our main line from the hose bib in the head assembly there, got it into the garden where we took our main line and created some header rows to run our three drip line runs off each per bed. We installed some button drippers in a container and we showed you how to do a drip line run in a container. We flushed the system, turned it on to troubleshoot for any leaks, and now it's working fantastically. So even though this is the design we went with, you don't have to follow this strictly. As you've seen with how the parts go together, the possibilities are almost endless. Do with what works best for you. Hope this gave you the confidence you need to install your own raised bed irrigation kit. It's really actually quite easy and will save you a considerable amount of time. If this video helped you, give us a like. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. We monitor our channel, we'll be happy to help you out. Or you can contact us at dripdepot.com. We look forward to hearing from you.